Hi, everyone. I see we have a few people coming in. We'll give everyone a second to get their audio going and everything. Welcome. Hi, Neat. Yeah. <laughs> All right, welcome guys. We've just got a few more people entering the call and we'll get started in a few seconds. All right, Heather, is that everybody for now? I think so. I'll okay. let you know. So I'll introduce myself first. Uh, hi everyone. Oh, we've got still got people coming in, but I'll get started. Um, my name's Tanya LeClaire and I'm the high school digital learning coach here at SFS. And thank you so much for joining us today for a conversation about how you might help organize your child's life. I know there's so many things going on, especially with virtual learning and so many different platforms that children are using in their learning, which is wonderful, but at the same time can be overwhelming. So hopefully we'll give you some information today that will help you in your support for uh, students and for your children, really. And we've got a very experienced uh, co-host with me today. I'll, I'll hand it over to her to say hello. Hi, my name is Heather Breedlove and I'm the digital learning coach at the elementary school. I do have three children of my own who I'm helping to organize, uh, one in elementary, one in middle and one in high school, as well as helping parents and students at the elementary school uh, organize their digital lives. Great, so yeah, hopefully our, both of our perspectives will help guide you today. Um, this, this might be geared a little bit towards the um, upper grade levels just because there are more platforms that kids are using and more reasons for them to want to organize themselves. Um, but it should apply to everyone and hopefully even apply to you. I mean, we've got so many things we're using every day that maybe you'll get some tips and tricks um, that will help you in your own work every day. So the first thing we want to do is do a little poll to find out uh, what, where your students are at in school. So I'm going to bring that poll in front of you here. Can everyone see the poll right now? Great, so why don't you go ahead and fill in what section your child's in, and this will help us gain an understanding of where you're coming from and how we might best support you during today's PD or during today's parent chat. Okay, so got some responses coming in. I love watching the polls in real time. I'll, show, I'll share with you results in a moment. So we do have a variety, which is great. Uh, we've got 13 of 18 people. I'll give you a few more seconds. If you're just joining us now, we've uh, welcomed you. My name's uh, Tanya LeClaire. We've got Heather Breedlove here with DLCs in both the high school and elementary. And we're going to chat a little bit about organizing your child's digital life. But first we're just doing a poll that you'll probably see in front of you, asking you uh, what section of school your child's in. That way we can best support you today. So. We've got a few more people going to fill it out and I'm gonna end it in about five, five or six seconds. So whoever's writing on the screen, <laughs> someone's annotating on the screen. I'm not sure, but I did block my annotation. So I'm just going to get Heather, maybe you can take care of that for us while we're, <laughs> yeah, we're, while we're looking. Um, all right, so I'm gonna end the poll now. Not everyone filled it out, but it still gives us an idea of where people are at. And I'm just gonna bring those uh, results in front of you. So we've got an, uh, more high school parents than anyone else, but we do also have a variety of parents from lower elementary, from middle school, key stage three, key stage two, and key stage one. So really all over the place today. So welcome everyone. And we'll just continue along with what we're going to look at today. So I'm going to just share the results. You guys can see those, right? Excellent. So um, so moving on, we are going to go into what we're going to look at today. So our key takeaways today are going to be good habits at home. So how we might support our children at home. We're going to look at managing a cluttered inbox. And I know that um, not all of us have cluttered inbox, but some of us do. So hopefully these tips might help both you and your child. But uh, students are using email and helping them with a few strategies how they might uh, organize their email or how you might support them in organizing your email. We're going to talk about that. We're also going to talk about um, some reminders and how students might help themselves by setting reminders or tasks. We're going to talk about searching and organizing a drive because that's where students are keeping their work. That's where classroom keeps work. So uh, organizing Google Drive and how to search that in detail. And we're going to talk about finding assignments and calendars. The final thing, we're going to give you some kind of pro tips on organization and a few apps that might be new to you. So 
that's what we're going to cover. And we'll have some Q&A at the end. So if you have some questions, uh, feel free to hold on to those. And at the end, we'll take any questions from you. And hopefully, we'll, uh, you'll leave today with a few more skills in your toolbox than you came with. So let's move forward. I have one more poll for you that I wanted to ask. And the question is, how did you learn to stay organized when you were in school? Because I think back to when I was in school, and I don't remember learning about how to stay organized. So I'm going to launch that poll right now. And can you see that in front of you? I want you to make a choice. How did you learn to stay organized when you were in school? Did your parents teach you? Did you learn it? You were born organized. Someone was already disorganized. I see that already. <laughs> Picked it up along the way. I'm just curious because really, you know, do we ever think about how we learned to get organized ourselves? And is it something that we learned in school? So this is, uh, I see a few answers coming in. I'll give you a few more seconds to make your choice. And this is interesting. So far, picked it up along the way seems to be in the lead. So I'll share those with you in a moment. These are pretty fascinating. A few more seconds to come in. Think back. I think back and I did not learn how to get organized probably until I was an adult. <laughs> I might've picked it up along the way, but I don't quite remember. I know it's a hard one, but I'm gonna give you another second or two to make your choice. And some people are, but that's okay. Um, we're just gonna end the poll right now. And I'm gonna share these results with you because I find them fascinating. Um, do you guys see those in front of you? A lot of people pick them up along the way. A few always disorganized. Well, hopefully today will help you out a little bit. And some people learned in school, which is nice to see. So uh, no born organized people. No one was born organized, no? See some heads shaking. Okay, that's fine. Um, I don't think I can say that for myself either. How about you, Heather? Were you born organized? Maybe not. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna stop sharing now. And I am going to let you see that. Great, so um, we're going to move on now. So now that we've thought a little bit about how we got organized, I wanna show you some results from a recent grade nine survey. Um, we did a digital organization day in grade nine in high school where some of the students got to experience a few digital tasks and they learned some skills and tools and they got to do a bit of a, a breakout game all about digital organization. And at, along the way, I got some feedback from them on some of the things that they wanted to learn about, some of the ways they needed some support with getting organized. And um, I wanted to share a few of those with you. So some students were saying they'd like to learn more about organizing files and emails. Um, they think everything is set, so they don't really find anything challenging. Some of them are a-okay. Um, they wanna learn about using folders in Google Drive. Sometimes they find it hard to search. So different students have different challenges, but this is just some of the feedback we received from grade nine students. And I think this isn't unusual throughout school. I think you'll probably find a lot of similarities. Does anyone, I see a few hands of people saying, yeah, they find a few similarities with their own children. Yeah, okay, great. So I, I always think it's interesting to ask students and then find the ways that we support them. So that's just a few of what we noticed. Um, and it got me thinking about these skills that we maybe don't pick up along the way when we need them and how we might support them. And that's executive functioning skills. So exec executive function and self-regulation skills are the mental processes that enable us to plan, to focus attention, um, to remember instructions, to juggle multiple tasks successfully. The brain needs these to filter distractions, to prioritize tasks, things like working memory. So governing our ability to hold and manipulate information in the mind, things like a temporary sticky notes in your mind that help you kind of remember information. Things like self-regulation, enabling us to set priorities and resist impulsive actions. And then cognitive flexibility helps us to sustain or shift attention uh, or response to different demands or different rules in different settings. So we're not born with these. These are things that we have to develop along the way, pick up along the way. And the way that we can support them are by you know, considering our parent role. And the parent role does evolve over time. So I'm gonna hand it over to Heather. She, she's gonna describe some of the parent roles and how they might change from early years all the way up to high school. Yeah, and I just wanted to touch on the executive functioning uh, for a minute. Uh, research shows that, especially if you have like tween or teen boys, that that frontal cortex development doesn't really actually happen until they're like 20, 25 years old. So if you think about it, 
it takes them a while to get everything organized. And, and I see that in school working with students too. Whereas the girls might be a little bit more organized, your boys generally tend to be disorganized. And so the research backs that up. And in the, the men role, nodding their heads in the... <laughs> <laughs> and I've got a girl too, um, but I'm telling you, she's my youngest and she's way more organized. So that's just a personal experience as well. Um, and then the parent role does evolve over time. You have in the early years, parents as coaches, where you're telling them how to do things. Um, you're calling the plays. You're saying, when we're going to get home, this is what we're going to do. And then in the tween years, you become more of the manager and you're, you're not really telling them what to do, but you're kind of you know, um, managing, helping them manage their time and saying, hey, it looks like this needs to get done. How would you like to do that? Um, what are some options? And then in the teen years, you're more of the consultant. Um, and I'm learning this as I go, because I will be having a 16 year old um, in January. Um, and ideally you're just saying, you're checking in, you're saying, I'm here if you need me, um, let me know if you need help. Now, specifically, there's some examples here in my experience and work Tanya, can you go back real quick? Oh yeah, sure. Talk about, um, so like in the early years, uh, you it's, it's kind of defining screen time for the younger children. Um, it's not all equal. So when we say screen time, I think parents usually think it's entertainment time. Um, but in virtual learning, that line got blurred a lot um, and it's not equal, right? So we have, we're doing schoolwork on the screen and that's different than doing um, you know, the Among Us game that they're doing or whatever they're doing on their phones socially, right? They're socially connecting. And that's also different than like video creation and creating different things. So the, in the early years, you wanna kind of lay that foundation of like, we use devices for different things and then also helping them balance that screen time as well as saying, we had lots of conversations in the early years in the elementary of like how and what we share online, what's appropriate. Um, in the tween years, um, it's just all about providing awareness, I think, for the total device usage. Um, and actually, most of our students have Macs, um, laptops, iPhones, things like that. There's Android devices as well that allow you just monitor your screen usage. Um, I think they are just not aware of how long they're spending on things. And so we want to monitor that. Um, we want them to monitor that. Sometimes they're not there, though. So, for instance, you know, this is important when they're spending... They're like, oh, you spent half an hour on that video game when really it's probably like two hours, you know, that that video, the, the time just kind of goes away from them. So it's really building that awareness. I mean, this also happens to adults. It's known as the Netflix binge or the Facebook rabbit hole, you know, we go down. So it happens to us as well. Um, and then the other thing with the teen years is not only helping them build an awareness, but also um, how do they organize their email? How do they organize their digital work? sit down with them and say, hey, show me how you, you know what, what is due. Um, during virtual learning, I had to do that with my children because I got some emails from teachers of saying, oh, they're missing this or that. Or, and I was like, okay, show me. And then we talked about like strategies for them. And really they have to decide. I'm sure all of us here organize things differently. There's no one right way or wrong way, but it's finding out what works for them. And you know, with a teenager, they might like roll their eyes or make noises or, you know, not want to take your suggestion, but, you know, give your strategies. What works for you at work? What have you found? And then when you suggest that to them, they might do those things, but they might take you up on it as well. So for example, I just showed my son how to use Finder to, you know, organize by his recent files. And he kind of grunted at me and didn't want to do it. And then he realized, oh, I guess that's helpful, mom. I think I might, might try that. So just keep trying. <laughs> and then, you know, kind of building on that, building some good habits at home, um, designating work spaces for the kids. And this is challenging. I mean, especially if you have multiple children, uh, we're running out of bedrooms, we run out of rooms to, for them to work. Um, but here's the thing, um, I heard a long while ago, it's really important to designate a space because it kind of sets the tone for how they work. So if, for instance, they're at their desk and they're always doing homework and that's the, what they do there, when they go there, that kind of sets the, their mindset, their brain to say, hey, when you sit here, you usually do homework and it gets them in that working mode. Um, so it is kind of just think about your spaces and mine have to change as well in my house. Um, so it might be the kitchen table and that's okay. 
um, and sometimes it's okay to switch it up, but setting that designated space is important. Also installing a whiteboard for visual tracking. Um, I know we've done this. I've found that with, and I work a lot with the upper elementary as well with their digital organization, especially in like exhibition, um, that they are not at the level yet where they can do everything digitally and organize digitally. And even my own, my own way of organizing, sometimes I have to go visual like sticky notes on my computer screen. I'm sure some of you might have that. Um, and it's just a way for them to visually track. And sometimes with children, we have to do both ways, both physical and digital before they make a transition into maybe fully digital or fully using a digital uh, calendar, things like that. So that is an important piece to make that transition of how to organize digitally. They have to do it physically first. Um, and then with family media agreements, um, we're gonna share something later that links to Common Sense Media. That's one that we share in the elementary and it has a good just family agreement that you can use and just start the discussion of what is it, you know, where do we wanna have our devices? Uh, where do we store them at night um, so children can get some sleep? Um, what do we do at dinner? You know, and it, and it just has to be a family agreement um, with everybody's input. I think that makes it, um, the families, children are more willing to whatever boundaries you have when they are involved in the process of decision making. Great, thank you, Heather. Um, I know that I, I mean, personally, I find that all these work for me as well. I work better when I have a working space. I organize better when I have a whiteboard. So hopefully these might work as well for you. I know I definitely have post-its all over my computer, so. Um, so let's get into some really detailed stuff about how we might organize the tools that we use. And I know many of you probably use Gmail as well for your work or your personal use. And students are using Gmail um, right up from upper elementary on. And a lot of times uh, they ask for things like how they might filter out their Gmail inbox so that it makes more sense to them or how they might recognize important messages. Um, also things like how to, how to organize your email so that you have the most important things on top. So I'm actually gonna show you some of the ways that you can do that. And we are gonna share at the end some resources and links on places you can find this information again. So don't worry if you can't remember right now, but it just shows you what's possible and how you might wanna sit down and help your child in organizing their digital tools. So let's look at Gmail. And I've got a, this is an email box of a fake student, but this gives you an idea of the type of email box that students might see and how Google Classroom can fill it up. Does this look familiar to anybody if you've seen your, your child's email inbox? Um, now, this does also depend on a, on a teacher's way of uh, notifying students. So not all email boxes are the same. Uh, maybe the teacher might have set some settings in Google Classroom that makes it so they don't get uh, certain notifications or the student might also turn off notifications. That's a little hit or miss because they might miss something that's important, but there are ways for them to filter their email box so that they can see the things they need to see and maybe at the same time have it a bit more organized. So I want to look over here and this is a, a student's email. Um, I want to look over here at this cog wheel and um, Heather, give me a nod if you can see that just so I know. Yep. Um, if you click here, that's your settings. And if you haven't looked in here, this is a magical toolbox for Gmail. This is where you can organize how you want to see your mail. So what I like to do is I actually like to set either a priority inbox or um, depending on how you like your email to look, you can set it in uh, important first. I'm going to go to priority and show you that one just because that's how I like to organize my work email. So I'm going to go to priority inbox and I'm going to customize it right here. And I've got my zoom in on here. So, so bear with me. Hopefully you can see that. Now, this is where I'm going to organize what I see first and so on. So I want to see my important messages first or important and unread. Maybe you could just say unread, but I'll just keep that there. And then after that, I want to see my starred messages. And then after that, I'll see everything else. And I've, I've set that up. Let's see. This is the default. And this is the priority. So you can kind of choose what you want to see there. Now, if I go back to, or if I go down, that's, I'm gonna, well, it would say save, but I think I was already there. So I'm going to go back to my inbox. And as you can see, I've got my important messages at the top, and those are labeled right here. I've got my starred messages second, and then I've got everything else third. 
So that kind of gives you an idea of how you might organize your inbox in a different way so that you see things in a way that's helpful or your students see things in a way that's helpful. So that's one way you can configure. There are other ways, but I won't get into all of them, but really just remembering that this cogwheel over here is where you can set how you see things. That's the most important thing. And then students can kind of go in and play with what they might like the most. And Tanya, that's really important, yeah. giving them the choice. Uh, there's three DLCs. Uh, and actually, there's four, and we all think organize our email differently. So yeah, we do. <laughs> we do. Yeah. And I even I in my pro my professional one, I like to add a reading pane as well. So if you go down here, you can add a reading pane where you can see the actual uh, preview of your email. Um, if you have a conversation selected, so that's another thing that you can have as well. You may not need it. It's totally your choice. And giving students that autonomy that. A choice is really important, but saying, hey, have you checked out the settings? Have you looked there and seen how you might organize yourself a little better? That's always good to do. So the next thing I'd like to show you is how you can create labels. And labels can help you keep organized on the side. Now, I know that this is um, might be hard to see, so I'm going to just zoom in there. But you can see that I've got some labels over here, and I've got one that I created already called Classroom Emails. I'm just going to zoom out so I can see. And we're going to go back to the little cogwheel up here. Cogwheel is the best place to be. And we're going to go to see all settings. If you click into there, you're going to see that there is a space called labels. And I've got some labels already. You can see the inbox, start, and so on. You probably recognize those from your own inbox. And I'm just going to go to create new label. And that's where I can say if I'm in a, a class, maybe I'm in a biology class, I can say I'm in, I'm in biology and I want to organize all of my biology emails in there. I just want to be able to drag and drop those into that label on the left hand side, and then I can create. You can also nest them underneath things if you have other labels that are main topic themes and you want to put that under. Um, you can also do that by nesting it, but I'll just keep it as a regular label and I'm just going to go create. Now. When I go to the side of my email inbox, you can see that I've got biology there. And if I'm in my inbox, I can say select an email and I can move that over to biology if I want to. So that's another way that they can, after the fact, uh, move emails into the labels area. So hopefully that makes a little bit of sense, but that's one way that students can actively uh, organize their inbox. You can also do kind of advanced things like create filters. And I'll show you that now. Now I know it's it's a few steps, but it shows you what's possible and it shows you what you might wanna go back to later with the information we're going to give you. Um, filtering, all that does is that kind of creates some automatic responses when emails come into your inbox. It automates it a little bit. So what we're going to do is create a filter. So I bet you can uh, guess where I'm going to go back to right now. Magical cogwheel, okay. I didn't hear anyone say it, but I imagined it in my head. Um, and we're going to click on all the settings. And what you're going to do is you're going to go up here to filters and blocked addresses. So I'm going to go filters and I'm going to create a new filter. Now there's a few ways to do this. Someone else might say, oh, well, you can start it from an email. There are different ways, but I'm going to show you this one here. So create a new filter. And we could say, we could put an email address in here that says anytime you get an email from so-and-so, it's going to go somewhere. Now, this is harder because we don't know, we, we don't wanna have to type in the whole email and everything like that, but we can also do has words. So for example, we could do Google Classroom assignments. What I might do is show you a little bit of an easier way, just so that you know, and I'm going to go back into the inbox and I'm going to show you an email call, let's see. Um, I'm gonna go into Evernote. I don't need to see this email. I could actually unsubscribe to it, or I could create a filter for any of the emails that come in from Evernote if I want to. So let's go up to these three dots and I'm going to go down to filter messages like these. See that? And you can do this with any message. Now, if I want to say all the no reply notifications from Evernote, I'd like to see them, but I don't need them to be in my inbox. I can create a filter for those right here. So I'm gonna go create filter and I'm gonna say, I don't want that to go to the inbox. I'd like to apply a label and I'd like that to go into the left-hand side 
into another place. Maybe it's not biology, maybe it's not classroom emails, but it's the type of email I wanna keep. So I'm gonna make a new label for that. And I'm gonna call that automatic emails. And I actually use this same uh, label in my inbox because I wanna take all of those kind of uh, emails from tools that I use and I wanna keep them so maybe I can look at them, but I don't wanna keep them in my inbox all the time. So I'm gonna call that automatic emails and I'm going to create that. And then I'm going to apply it to all of the matching conversations, all of the other emails from Evernote in my inbox. And I'm going to create a filter. So now if I go down here, I've got, well, maybe it didn't show up yet. Here it is, automatic emails. And you can see that that is in there already. So it's kind of filtered out of that inbox. Now let's look at the Google Classroom emails. Sometimes we maybe don't need to see all of them in our inbox all the time. And maybe we wanna organize those a little bit differently and students will wanna organize those. So for example, um, we've got, sometimes teachers will give announcements or Let's see, I don't have one in here maybe right now, but I'm just gonna use this one, uh, new question. So say we wanna filter all of the questions from teachers into the left-hand side of the email box so that they're all in one place. So I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm going to go up to the three dots and I'm going to filter messages like these. And I'm going to put in subject I'll just put in question for now. And that's in the actual subject of the email. So chances are this will be uh, similar for all of those. I'm going to go create a filter. And what I might do is have it skip the inbox. I'm going to apply a label and I'm going to choose classroom emails. And then I'm gonna match it for all the conversations that are currently in my inbox. And I'm going to create the filter. So now I have I'm gonna go back to my inbox. If I look below classroom emails, I've got my questions in there. Inside classroom emails, I've got my questions in there. So that's a few examples of how you can filter. There's no one way to decide on the labels and the filters you use, but it shows you the mechanism and then how you might introduce that to your child. They do see it sometimes in school. I know I showed the grade nines, but Again, it's just nice to have that understanding of what's possible with the organization. Um, and then a few other things I mentioned, starring messages that are important. So maybe always starring assignments so we know that those are going to be very important and revisited later. And then one of the last things I had on that slide there is called schedule send. Um, now this is a big one. I know that if you're uh, teaching a school, a high school kid, um, or if you're a teacher of high school children, um, you probably get emails late at night. And I know that I do too. Sometimes kids ask me questions. So there actually is a way that you can compose an email and you can schedule to send it later on. So I'm gonna, I have my computer in front of my screen. So I'm gonna show you how that works. If you wrote an email and then you go down to the bottom you can actually schedule to send it later on. So apologize for my camera, but yeah, you don't have to send it at the time that you have chosen. So for example, if I schedule send that, oh, I have to specify a recipient. I'm gonna choose Mr. Holcomb. Yeah. So Jeff Holcomb is going to get an email this afternoon at 1 p.m. <laughs> so, so I'm schedule sending that. I won't actually send it, but, uh, that's basically how that works. So it's one of those little tips and tricks that actually is quite useful. And when I showed the grade nine students this, they were like, oh man, we didn't know we could schedule send. That's great. We don't have to send emails at 11 o'clock at night. So, uh, so yeah, that's just a fun tip. Um, so hopefully some of these email tips have helped you. Um, I'm going to move on to a few of the pro tips that I like. Um, Quick, Heather, did you want to add anything? Yeah, yeah, just real quick with the email. I was also going to yeah. say too, which email we have like unlimited storage space. I know in like Microsoft, if you're used to using that, depending if it's not cloud-based, you have to like delete messages and stuff. We never have to delete messages, which is part of the problem. Um, the kids are, you know, afraid or they're just going to leave them in their inbox. Um, what you can do is just check them all and you can actually click archive. What's mm -hmm. cool about Gmail is it's your own personal search engine. So you can archive an email and it doesn't, it doesn't um, delete it, but it kind of um, removes it from your inbox and you can search for it later. So I do a lot of that. 
If I don't need it right then and there, I just archive it and don't worry about it because I can always find it later. So it's another way yeah. to organize. Yeah, you can also, uh, sometimes I'm you'll sorry. see on, oh, sorry. Where does it go when you archive it? Uh, good question. Uh, Tanya, on the left, if you click under more, it goes under uh, all emails, all mail. Uh, go back. Okay, so go down. Click under more and it's, it should be like all mail, all mail. Yeah, this one here. You are essentially removing like a label of inbox and it goes to all mail, but it's always searchable. It's great. So, yeah. Thanks for the question. Yeah, sorry, we didn't hear you right away. <laughs> um, yeah, there. you know what? There's so many different little things you can do. There's actually a, a fun, I wanted to show you um, a few kind of pro tips and tricks right now. And these, one of the, the best ones that some of the teachers have really enjoyed hearing about is called Pause Inbox. And we're going to give you a link to this tool later on, but it's, it's this really neat extension that allows you, you can see my cursor up here, it allows you to pause your inbox so that you don't receive emails until a certain time. So if a student's working on an activity and they don't want to be uh, you know, overwhelmed with the amount of emails coming in, what they can do is install this extension, which we'll give you the link to later, and they can pause their inbox for maybe five hours, 10 hours, 24 hours if they want to. Let's go crazy. Um, but they can just do it for the amount of time that makes sense to them. And this is great for adults too. Um, you know, so it's one of those little tools that's an add-on. It's an extension uh, for Chrome if you're using Chrome and Gmail. And you can pause that for as long as you need so that you don't get those distractions. Another one is if you right click, I know a lot of times students are using Hangouts or Chats and they get those, doo -doo 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 -doo, they get those little messages coming in. What you can do is you can right click. I think you guys can see this. You can right click on the tab and you can mute the site. Now I can't, uh, close up on that because I'm already right clicked, but you can see how a menu drops down and you can mute it. And that way, if you're working in another area of your computer or another window, you won't hear those notifications coming in and just taking away one more little distraction. So that's a really helpful one that I also really like, especially right now where I'm talking to you, I don't want little do 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 messages coming in. So uh, that's a fun one. And then the last one, and I don't, uh, I'm on my student example, so I don't have this one installed. So I'm gonna go back to the um, presentation, but this one here is called Tab Snooze. And this is an extension that if you install it onto Chrome, uh, it will allow you to snooze a tab you're looking at um, on Chrome for like later today or tomorrow. And all it does is it just keeps it somewhere in your Chrome uh, memory, and then it pops up when you enable it too. So say you, you're looking at something and you're like, oh, this isn't good. I wanna look at this tomorrow. I don't have time today. You can just snooze that tab. And then tomorrow when you wanted to look at it, it will pop up. So it's just another little pro tool that I know I like to use a lot. I know Heather, you started uh, looking at that one too. So it's a fun one and it's a good one to consider if you wanna up your kind of di less distraction level <laughs> of what you're doing at home. So those are a few uh, different tools. Now we're gonna look a little bit at uh, advanced searching in Drive and how a student's drive is organized. And this is, you know, most Google Drives will, will work very similarly. So this might also help you out, um, but we're going to go into the drive from the email here. If you're not if you've never seen this little waffle over here, um, this is great. That's where you can access all of your Google tools. And if I go into the drive, and this is from a student's email, so you can see that what that looks like for students, you can see that they have some of the quick access things that uh, I've been working on or the students been working on and some other things here. And the most important thing is you can see that they've got this classroom folder. Can everyone see that? This is where Google Classroom assignments and work that they've done will feed into automatically. So if they're working in Google Classroom and they've turned something in or they're working on something, Classroom automatically creates this folder and it organizes their work. So you can see that they've got the different classes. These are Some of these are named test and things like that, but you can see how they look. Um, and then within that, they've got different assignments that they've done. This one was about a puppy. 
Um, these are just test assignments, so please don't think this is a real student. Um, but yeah, that's how their drive is organized. And then if you're in drive, some people don't realize this, but if you go up to this arrow here, you can click that and you can do an advanced search. So if you're not sure about something and you want to kind of search it in a way that might help you find it, uh, if you really don't know where it is, this one gives you a lot more options. So you can search by type. So if you've got a student or yourself and you're like, oh, I did this presentation once, I really want to find that one again, you can search by presentation. You can search by owner. So if the student is working on a collaborative document with other students and maybe they didn't start it, so it's owned by someone else, you can search by owned by someone else or a specific person. You can search by date, which is great. You can search by starred, which starred just like an email, you can star uh, documents or things you're working on so you can find them easily again later on. Or you can get into some more detail down here and search by item name. So I'm just gonna search presentations. And then anytime I did a presentation, there it is. You can see them all pop up and that might help you filter out what you're looking for a little bit easier. This is a quick tip, but it's just a useful one. I find that I'm always looking for things in Drive and students are even, you know, even more so they're looking for maybe old assignments or things they're currently working on and maybe it's not organized the way they want to. Now, I will show you a few other tips. Um, one of the things I really like is starring things like I mentioned. So for example, say a student's working on something and they would like to go revisit that really fast later on, what they can do is hit this little star and that will keep that in a special place in their drive so that they can find it later. So sometimes this might be a good recommendation for students who are currently working on something and they wanna get back to it fast. And then if they go to start, they see that that is there. So that's just a quick tip that I like to use a lot. Um, I often star things so that I can revisit them fast. And same in Drive, you can, actually the priority, I'm not sure about that one. That's for work. Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna chime in yeah, here. You can talk about that one. Um, at the at the end of the year in elementary, uh, I know the students, what we'll do is, uh, for example, in fourth grade, when they're done with the year, we tend to make a grade four folder and they might have subject folders anyway. And then we kind of roll all those folders together under a grade four. So by fifth grade, they have a third grade folder, a fourth grade folder and a fifth grade folder. And I don't know what they do at middle school or high school, but that's just something I actually do that personally as well. Like it, whatever work I'm doing throughout the year, um, towards the end of the year, if it's not something that's gonna continue and it's specific to that year, I roll it up in that year's folder. And that just helps um, clean up my drive because Tanya and I, we have like, I have 50 gigs in my, my Google Drive. There's a lot of files. Yeah, in I don't want to show you it. So that's just something I know um, students are doing and it could be a, another helpful tool to, to navigate yeah. as they fill up their Google Drive. The last one with Thrive I'll show you and this one's just a fun one. Um, I right clicked on this, on this folder and I'm going to go down to change color and I'm just gonna change the color of that folder. And just doing that can help you organize a little bit more. And especially if you have a folder specific to certain areas, like say it's clubs, and then you have a class, and then you have a after school activity, maybe you can color those, code those in a way that might help you find that later on or you know, personal folder. So um, I know I do that in mine and it's just a helpful visual reminder of what you're, what you're working with. So those are some tips from Drive. Um, we're going to go back now and I'm going to show you uh, a few things about finding assignments because there are a few tips and tricks with Google Classroom and uh, the Guardian summaries, which I'm sure a lot of parents know about already, but I just wanted to show you a few things and we will move along a little bit faster just so that we can get to everything. Um, so let's look back at our student. And I'm in a Google Classroom dashboard now. And this is the all the classes that this student is in. Now, sometimes students find it cumbersome to go back and forth to classes and find all the assignments and everything that they need to do. But there actually is a quick way for them to see everything all at once. And if they go up to this little button called To Do right here, and they click on that, they can actually see all of the things that they have to do. Now, there's not a lot here because this is a test student, but um, they can see all of the work that they have assigned for all classes or by 
individual class. So they have nothing in this class, but they have something in that class. They can also see work for next week and for later on. Uh, this is this example. Obviously, I'm just using the student as a test, so you don't see a lot. But some students will see a whole, you know, line of things. They can also see work that's missing. So that's another thing. Um, I got a few things missing. And then we've got some work that's done as well. So it's one place and it really is helpful for them to see all of that there. And just one, one little tip that not everyone really knows to look to. I think that was, Heather, was this an update last year to Google Classroom or? Yeah, they made it easier yeah. to access and students because students were even saying, I can't find my work. I don't even know yeah. how to navigate all the different classrooms. So this is a dashboard of sorts that really helps them. I know that's what I did as a parent when I sat down with my kids and said, okay, how are you doing on virtual learning? Let's check your missing. Yeah. <laughs> Let's check missing. Yeah, that's a helpful one. Um, and then as usual, Google has the calendar function too. So students can kind of look ahead in a calendar format. These are the assignments that were assigned and due in Google Classroom. This won't include the things that have maybe just been put in manage back, for example, but if the, if it was assigned to Google Classroom and it's due in Google Classroom, then you should see it there because the teacher has put a date, a due date on that. So that's just one more thing to consider. Um, so that's a quick tip in Google Classroom. Um, I wanted to show you also in manage back, this is a, another fake student in manage back, but this is what the dashboard looks like for a student. Uh, so they've got upcoming events and deadlines. And then the calendar here in manage back, if you can see that, you can also click on that and you can see upcoming uh, now this obviously the student is not the greatest example because it's a fake student, um, but you can see when tasks and projects assigned in manage back are due as well. So depending on how, especially I know for high school, depending on how they might be assigning certain tasks, you may see more in Google Classroom. Generally, that's the way it is. And then maybe some larger assignments or things to do with maybe personal project and so on will be in there. So that is uh, really you know, special for that class and that grade level. But um, but yeah, that's kind of the, the one stop place that you can see assignments in both Manage Back and Google Classroom. So going back here, um, Guardian Summaries, they should be going to parents if the teachers enabled it. Well, I'm going to go back. Um, but all the Guardian summary is, is just a bit of a short email weekly or however, maybe some parents have chosen a different interval for how they'd like to receive them. But it just gives you an update on what the students are working on assigned in Google Classroom and maybe what's coming up as well. So if you aren't receiving uh, Guardian summaries, you can let us know and we'll give you our contact at the end and then we'll try to activate those for you. But it, for the most part, parents of our teachers have activated those guardian summaries to go to parents um, and then parents would have to go into their email accept it and choose the permissions for that so so if you're not receiving those just let us know and also keep in mind with the the guardian summaries it's an automatic email from google so if a student's showing up missing work it doesn't necessarily mean it, it's missing it's worth a conversation to have with your child and then the teacher because sometimes they might have just forgot to mark it as done so just check into it Great. Um, and then uh, assessment calendars are available on the uh, soulforeign.org slash uh, SFS dash events. I'm going to link that to you guys later, but if those are the high school assessment calendars, and if you haven't seen those already, we'll be uh, giving the links for those to you guys at the end. But those calendars are accessible so that you can see what teachers have put in um, for what's due. I know that if I go to test student, I don't believe I would see anything, but um, if the student subscribes to those, which they they can, um, they would see them in the calendar. Now, students have had those shared with them, and so did, so have parents. So if you're unable to find them, please let us know, but we'll link those to you as well. And those are just uh, teachers add to those based on all of the, um, I guess, Jeff, those would be the major assessments. Is that correct? Um, sort of the... Yeah, anything that um, we're saying is is taking more than 20 minutes or so, that's a major okay. assessment, is on, is on that calendar. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, great. So we'll move on a little bit just so we have time for Q&A. Oh, Heather, did you have one more thing? Yeah. Uh, just to clarify that in Google Classroom, um, only your child has access to see inside Google Classroom. So if you'd like to see inside, because I mentioned I sat down with my kid, my own kids and said, okay, show me you're missing and, and that kind of thing. I don't have access in their classroom as a parent. Mm -hmm. um, 
for example, though, in Manage Back, as a parent, you have your own account as well as your child. There are separate accounts. So I just want to clarify that. The only thing that yeah. you're able to see in uh, Google Classroom is sitting down with your child or through the automated email from the Guardian Summary. Mm -hmm. So to clarify. Thank you, Heather. Yeah, that's an important one. So. <laughs> All right. So going back here, we're going to just, oh, yeah, a few more. These are some fun uh the pro tips, um, but these are a few organization apps that you might find useful um, for both yourself and your students. I know that I find them very useful. Um, the first one is Google Keep, and I'm going to show this uh, what this looks for you, what this looks like for you. The second one is called Focus Keeper, and this is actually a timer. Uh, Pomodoro method is a method of timing tasks for about 25 minutes and then giving yourself a bit of a break. And this app is free and it allows you to time yourself doing tasks. So if you have trouble keeping on, you know, on topic or on task for a little, little while, which I know I do sometimes, then this is a great app to consider adding to your phone or suggesting to maybe an older student that they might try out themselves and it keeps them working at a pace that they want to work at. And then another tool is also Evernote. Um, this isn't essential and it's not something we use in all the classes or anything like that. It's not tied to anything we do at school, but I find that for me, just, just taking notes sometimes, having a, either a notes app or Evernote is really useful and I'll show you what those look like. So Google Keep, the one that I mentioned first, that is a free, uh, both a web-based and a phone app and you can install it. It attaches also to your email. You can activate a little side panel, but it's a great way to set reminders for yourself or suggest it to your child and have them maybe set some reminders. You can time them so you can have little pop-ups on your phone or on your computer and it allows you to color code them. So it's just one way to consider adding some reminders to your day. I know that there's a few different Gmail ones. There's also tasks in Gmail, um, but they're both the, the same idea. They allow you to set reminders. I know that I often forget to do things unless I set a reminder on my phone and keeps one of those tools that helps me with that. And then Evernote is just a way to keep some notes and they have a free version. So if, if uh, your child is looking for a way to kind of compile a bunch of stuff, maybe curate items from the internet, curate websites, you know, take some notes. This is just a great accompaniment to what they're already using. And it's one that they might want to consider. There are other tools for this, you know, using docs and drive is great as well, but just finding that system that works for you and how you might want to collect and organize yourself. These are just a few suggestions. So, so yeah, those are some great uh, organizational tools. So let's go back here. I want to get to the Q&A, um, but before that, I'll just share with you what we are going to be giving you to take away with. The first thing is a page of resources, and this is all the stuff that we mentioned today. So all of the apps, all of the sites, you've got links to all of the Gmail and Drive things that we did. So you can take this away with you. Um, you can type in this bit.ly down here to get access to that document. And we're also going to share with you the whole you know, the whole presentation. This is the bit.ly to get the presentation. So you'd have to type in bit.ly and then this code. And then these are links to the HS student website for digital organization, which gives them all sorts of tips and tricks on Gmail, on Drive, on Calendar, on everything that you need. And then here's our email as well at the bottom. So um, we have, I guess, a few minutes left. So we want to make sure we open it up for questions to you. So if you have a question, please feel free to unmute yourself and go ahead and ask. Tanya, I also put everything in the chat, so I'm linking. Oh, perfect. Thank you, Heather. So you guys can have access to that right now. Yeah. So yeah, any questions? Any burning organizational questions? Maybe you feel like you're, is everyone feeling like a pro now? Hope so. Yeah, I <laughs> see some nodding heads. Don't check all their emails, they're ready. <laughs> <laughs> so if you don't have any today, that's okay. Um, but what you can do is please check out the resources we've sent. If you have any questions about how you might help your student become more organized, how you, even if you're just like, man, what was that app you talked about? I forget. You can email us, uh, not a problem at all. And we're happy to help you. Um, and yeah. I guess if there's no questions, we'll leave this. Uh, I just have I just have one quick question. Sure, uh, so I just wanted to know. Uh, so high school students, especially, have you know, uh, have you had a session like this with them as well in terms of you know how to organize their work? Because you know, coming from teachers from the school is much better than you know parents telling them yeah. uh, what to do. <laughs> uh, so uh, have have you had a session with the high school students as yet? 
So uh, at the beginning of the year, I speak with all the new incoming students and talk to them about all of the different tools we use and get them sort of set up on their Wi-Fi and their Gmail and all that sort of thing. Okay. And then I also got a chance to go into uh, classes for all the grade nine students during the, we had a kind of a day where we got to do rotations around and do some different things. So I got to do that with them. And then what I will also do is go into classes based on need. If there are students that need extra help, um, they might need me to walk them through th some things separately, I'll do that. But really it's based on need for the rest of the grades at this point. Um, yeah, so depending on, and, and this might be something we would do down the road as well, but currently so far this year, that's what we've done. Okay, okay, thank you. And I was also wondering if maybe you could um, speak to do you recommend or use or not recommend any of the sort of apps or programs that um, limit the social media noises or you know let you focus on just your assignment for a certain chunk of time because I know with some parents we we're talking about chunking up time and yeah you know, help with that what are your thoughts on that I think you know managing social media is one of those things that you know you want to make sure that you're still giving this the student or the child the freedom to make some choices in how they might manage it. Um, so if you're going to consider that, I think that's a choice that they should be involved in. Um, but I do think that looking at the screen time, especially if you're using an Apple phone, you can monitor screen time, you can see the apps that you're using and how long you're using them. So I think a discussion about that is important, involving the student and then perhaps proposing some, but I don't think it's healthy when parents uh, mandate that that has to happen. So I think if as long as the students involved in the decision and maybe they are like, okay, I'll try that out, then there's not a problem with it. Um, as long as they feel connected to it too. Well, and I'm gonna I'm gonna echo what you said, Tanya, because we recently sat down and I think one of the really big tips for this is we sat down and watched social the social dilemma. It's on Netflix with our yeah, um, highly recommend that one. And um, I haven't completed the whole thing. I mean, we got about halfway through, you know, attention spans. And we just had an open conversation about, wow, our phones are designed to like pull us in. And I told, I shared about like how I turned off my notifications. So I don't get all the red um, little circles about millions of things vying for my attention. And I, it was a simple thing. I've also organized um, from another article I read, I moved all my social media into a folder and moved it on the second screen, something very simple but I just talked about how that helped me focus and I'm not seeing it first on my, on my screen. Um, yeah. and, and I, that's kind of all we did. And we just, and we are constantly having screen time conversations in our house about entertainment and balancing and getting homework done. So yeah, um, definitely happy in my house, but my son came back to me, uh, my high schooler and said, you know, mom, I did that. I did that notifications thing. And I just said, Oh, how did that work for you? <laughs> Just an open, you know, question. And and he said, Yeah, I, I like it. I, I like it. I can go in when I want. I said, Oh, so that gives you control over it rather than it controlling you. And and so again, it's just the start of a conversation and and uh we're, you know, we're still working on it. But uh yeah, it was, I think helpful, it was helpful just to have watch that movie and really kind of do that. Yeah, if they're involved in the the reasoning. And, and the understanding there, that's really the key, you know. And Tanya, we have a question. Can you oh. do this for middle school students as well? And she might have left already, um, but I think we have another digital learning coach at middle school, but I'm not sure if she's done these exact sessions. Yet. I know she does sessions um, on various topics and, uh, but yes, yeah, we can't speak. Yes, exactly. However, this session currently is open to all students in the yeah. school. So, so we'll yeah. be sharing it. Yeah. Does anyone else have a question for us? Yes. Yeah. Um, I'm going to expose, with my question, I'm going to expose how, how stupid I am in this area. But luckily, I've been able to get away with um, my ignorance because my son is very smart. He's a new freshman at SFS transferring from YIS, which uses a different stiff system. They use Schoology and he's a smart kid. So he seems to be on top of things. He seems to be doing fine. What with the support that you gave him. But I myself, I maybe because of coronavirus, but I feel like compared to like um, at YIS when they switched over to Schoology, they had several 
um, meetings with parents one on one, showing them how to set up the Schoology, how to do it. And I'm really, I'm like a little old grandma. I'm like a lady twice my age when it comes to technology. So I made use of that and I did figure out how to use Schoology eventually. But to be honest, because my son's in ninth grade and he's such a smart kid, this was all way over my head. I still don't even know how to, the, you know, IB system versus um, uh, the AP system. I still don't even know when that, when I do see my son's grades, I have even, I don't even know what those grades mean. Okay. <laughs> and then I don't need, yeah, and I'm, I'm still trying to figure out how to find his grades. A couple of days ago before this, my husband did figure out how to open the manage back because before when I click on it, something in Korean would pop up. And so I think my, I'm sort of on the right track, but I'm kind of wondering, is this because of coronavirus that parents were not, or, or um, they just figure that most parents are not as bad with technology as me. And so they didn't have any um, uh, get parent, new parents acclimated to manage back and Google classroom kind of thing. Like, uh, is, is that because of coronavirus or is that they just figure most people are not as stupid about this as I am. <laughs> so that's a good question, Brendan. I don't, I don't think you're uh, stupid at all. Um, actually, we, we were a bit limited with our new parent orientation this year because of COVID and the lack of ability to have parents on campus. Uh, so normally on registration day, when we have all the new parents and students on, uh, there's better access to digital learning coaches like Tanya and Heather um, to walk you through a lot of that stuff in person. But I know that we are a lot more limited uh, this year. So uh, what I would encourage you is that um, uh, Tanya is available and has connected with parents lots of times just to help get them uh, set up. And she's done it remotely with new students, getting them in through COVID and, and is a great resource. So I'd encourage you to reach out to Tanya. Yeah, I'm okay, happy to help you. you. Happy to help. And um, and this feedback's great because it helps us know what we might, you know, want to uh, give her opportunities later on. So uh -huh. thank you for the uh -huh. feedback. And Brenda, <laughs> parent to parent, I had the uh -huh. same. I had a freshman. He came from the uh -huh. British school. I, uh -huh. you know, we just started working here. IB was uh -huh. new to us. It, it takes about six months. Get yourself. <laughs> okay. yeah. okay. You'll get there. You'll get there. Yep. Okay. I need, I, well, I know that I'm, I was being lazy. I need to make more of an no. effort. Now that I'm, now that it's about the time the oh, grades yeah. are going to come out, I really, oh, I need to see, to see my grades. How can I see my son's grades? I better get on the ball here and figure it's this okay. out. Okay. It's okay. It takes a while. It's a transition for all of us, for yeah. sure. Definitely. Thank you. And can I mention something about the MySFS page as well? Mm -hmm. There is, uh, if you go into MySFS, Brenda, on the high mm -hmm. school page, there's a link to the intro to Manage Back for Parents with okay. a lot of resources that kind of explain how to navigate around Manage Back for you. Okay. And mm -hmm. a lot, uh, as we're responding to COVID, we're developing a lot of uh, trainings and tutorials that kind of come just in time when you need them. So when reporting comes around, um, we'll provide more information at that time to help you understand. And, and we also have a lot of people looking at uh, ways to, to explain that gap and introduce you to the IB curriculum as well. Okay, great, great. That, that's awesome. I'm looking forward to it. I'm All putting right. the link in the chat and uh, providing uh, the, there's a password, what is it? SFS Great. So Heather's uh, put a few resources in the chat and we've got them on the screen. We've got a, about three minutes left because uh, we want to be cognizant of your time. But does anyone else have any more questions? All right, I don't see any hands or anything. So hopefully we've got a bunch of uh, email experts now. Oh, Sorry, I have a question. Got one more? Yeah. Yeah, um, I know that you put some information in the chat, but once we hang up from Zoom, can we still access that information or is it lost? It's lost for you. So I suggest um, on the screen, you see some links. There's Bitly. Mm -hmm. uh, you can go to the Bitly for today's presentation, the one for the resource page, or click the links in the chat currently. Um, we'll, we'll leave it open for a few minutes, but uh, yeah, I would open those now because you won't be able to access them after. And Tanya, right. we, we're going to email, we're actually, we're going to post this on the MySFS page yeah. and we can email out the recording uh, once that's all finished, as well as the resources. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Well, thank you everyone for coming today. Um, please reach out to us if there's any more you need. And um, I hope we were informative and helped you out with getting both your student and yourself organized. And yeah, I hope to see you in, in future uh, Zoom calls or yeah. in person. That'd be great yeah, too. That'd be great. Okay. <laughs> okay. Bye bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye.